Welcome to you all yeah. uh, to the first uh, event in the series of uh, events uh, hosted by Your Open Metaverse on uh, uh, Metaverse uh, Exploration. And we have the first explorers, uh, co founder of uh, Metaverse, uh, Your Open Metaverse, with us. Uh, what about uh, today? Why is it so special for you uh, to be here, uh, Daniel? Yeah, well, thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, so this is like the first uh, roundtable session uh, we're doing uh, with the Metaverse Exploring Group. Um, well, basically, I started this group uh, on LinkedIn uh, like uh, two, uh, two months ago, two and a half months ago. Uh, just really, yeah, basically to explore the metaverse. And uh, I think this is a great step, you know, doing these monthly roundtable sessions to get more into depth, to also like have industry experts uh, discussing really important uh, topics and challenges uh, together. And um, yeah, so and to really uh, to, to uh, spark uh, synergies, basically. So that's, you know, I'm look really looking forward to, uh, to doing these sessions uh, with you all. And um, yeah, it's very, uh, very cool to have you all here. So uh, thanks for joining. Very good. Already some of you are good clapping. Uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's practice that a little bit. Uh, for whom of you, right. it's the first time on uh, Spatial? Please uh, raise your hand. And you can raise your hand uh, if you're not in VR uh, by uh, uh, waving. So uh, that's... Uh, a control called uh, wave and you uh, just click two yeah okay so for some of you it's the first time thank you very much for introducing uh, this series of events uh, Danielle uh, van der Waal uh, and You're we welcome. will uh, explore uh, the topics in more detail but uh, first to uh, warm up a little uh, we are in spatial uh, for those of you who are uh, newbies here um, are you uh, already part of the metaverse community if you, uh, if you feel so, please uh, raise your hand. Yeah. Well, wh what some. is the definition of being part of a metaverse community? <laughs> That's a, an interesting yeah. one. <laughs> if it means that question. we hang out with people who like the metaverse, then sure. Um, but if there's a specific community of builders or something more organized, then uh, maybe not. So I guess it depends on your definition of community. Yeah, let's explore in uh, more detail during this session uh, what the metaverse uh, community is about uh, and what the economic aspects of it, uh, of it are. Uh, so what's your role in the metaverse community? Well, let's hear from uh, one of the other co-founders of uh, Your Open Metaverse and also of uh, the company called Beamup, um, Jorrit Velseboer. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Rick. Uh, happy to see you all here for the first uh, session. Uh, we picked uh, several topics actually for the for the upcoming uh, months to discuss. Uh, the, the topics are all based on the research from uh, PwC. And the first topic that is on the list that is very crucial, I think, also to uh, already start with a with a distinction uh, between two types of metaverse is the metaverse economy, um, because we are seeing quite a you know a, a diverse landscape in what a metaverse actually is. We are seeing, of course, spatial doing stuff. We are seeing uh, Meta, Facebook uh, uh, releasing their own uh, metaverse. And on the other hand, from the crypto community, you see a lot of innovations going on as well. And many of those innovations, they actually have, a, have a, quite a large impact for the, for the metaverse. And that's why we decided on uh, uh, putting the metaverse economy as the first major topic. And within this topic, we have four uh, defined uh, subtopics. We have four uh, speakers. We will be, uh, you know, uh, telling a little bit about that subtopic, and then we will have a discussion around that. Okay, um, and so that so that is basically the structure of the session uh, for today. Very good, and uh, everyone is uh, able and invited to uh, join in on the discussion uh, after uh, some talks of the uh, speakers here. Uh, you can always uh, raise questions. Just uh, raise your hand for that purpose, or wave, uh, click uh, number two, um, and. We will uh, happily 
uh, join have you join in on the conversation um you are also joining the conversation uh, from up there right uh, Jorrit? <laughs> yes uh, unfortunately i uh, i'm stuck flying around i can't fix it i tried to uh, rebooting my headset but for some reason my uh, physical positioning in spatial is always stuck to floating so i just positioned myself next to this uh, server rack uh, that we created for one of the uh, topics, subtopics that I'm uh, speaking uh, for. And, and uh, you know, the, the fact that I'm standing here is, you know, in a way uh, relevant, I would say, to the to the roundtable, uh, because that way I can introduce all of the subtopics and then, uh, you know, have, have a little bit of uh, oversight on the discussion. So for now, I'm uh, seeing it as a feature and perhaps in the next session, I have to reboot and reinstall uh, the whole application, <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that. Uh, we'll see how that progresses. Yeah, but for now, we will seize the opportunity to have you float around exactly uh, <laughs> several topics, and uh, you will be most meta of us all. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Jorrit Velsboer. Um The first topic um, is uh, decentralized. As economies, uh, what makes that topic uh, so urgent for now, uh, Jorrit? Yeah, so as I uh, just also mentioned, we have the whole uh, split between centralized metaverses where, uh, let's say, Facebook owns all of the data, owns the content that, 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 that is uh, hosted within the metaverse. And on the other hand, you have the web free companies doing a lot of creative stuff uh, within this new decentralized crypto community. And and, uh, you know, an, an expert on that topic is actually with us here today. His name is Jesse. And, uh, yeah, yeah let's, perhaps, let's uh, Jesse, you, you can uh, introduce yourself. More detail. He, he is the co-founder of uh, Medium, uh, Design DAO, uh, and it's a design community. And in that sense, is that an example of uh, a DAO? Uh, Jesse Rademacher. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Thumbs up. All right. I appreciate appreciate the intro. Um, really happy to be here today. This is my first spatial uh, conference. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a newbie here today, too. So don't feel like, like uh, anybody joining for the first time um, that you're late to the game. So my name's Jesse. Um, the, the, the topic of decentralized economies is really near and dear to our heart um, because what our community is is a, is a design peer-to-peer -peer network um, so these are just our design friends um, and medium is kind of the one-stop shop to get anything made from a design or innovation standpoint we we kind of bridge all the way from the digital world uh, connecting um, digital IP uh, basically, we're, we're a group of the world's best designers, so protecting our ideas on chain is always uh, something that, that we implore creatives to do because then NFT in our eyes is just uh, how you manage your IP on chain. Um, so, yeah, to, to get to the topic of decentralized economies, this is um, the perfect topic, I think, to start with because from our perspective, we've been building medium for three years now and we're launching uh, an nft collection next month uh, it's going to be amazing I, i'm not going to talk about too much specifics on that but um, it's just a use case for the system that we've built so we've built infrastructure for the decentralized economy for the last three years and so medium itself has gotten um, over three years later without taking on outside capital uh, we have no fiduciary responsibility to anybody else in the world. Uh, we are on a progressive decentralization model to becoming a DAO. Obviously, I'm in the U.S., so um, we just need some of the, the space to actually mature, the DAO space to mature legally and, and some things like that. But we think that decentralized economies, um, we think Web3 is kind of a yin and a yang between the tools of Web3 and basically the decentralized economies of Web3. And most importantly, the people that run decentralized economies are just communities. They're just people organizing around some sort of common interest. And 
all of a sudden, when you start to decentralize things, oftentimes people say to me that decentralization means disorganization. Um, and I think that that's probably the, the furthest thing from the truth. Um, because decentralization just means you're distributing decision-making and wealth. That's it. You can still set up whatever structure, whatever organization, whatever smart contracts you want to. And actually, it's way more predictable for people. They can know what to expect with smart contracts. It's not always up to you know, a CEO's whim or the board's decision. All right, let's uh, hear in more detail uh, about the views on uh, decentralization and how to organize it still. And uh, a, bit, a bit of a paradox here, uh, yeah. according to some people. Let's hear in more detail. Uh, but for now, uh, thank you very much for outlining the topic, uh, Jesse Rademacher. Uh, we have uh, from the same jurisdiction, uh, relevant uh, for this topic, um, senior economic consultant at Moss Adams uh, with a wide experience in the public sector as well, uh, Sarah Hanika. You can join us uh, here at the table as well. <clears throat> Good morning. Oh, or well, just hello. I know it's not morning everywhere. Also, Jor it had his hand raised, so I don't know if he wanted to say something else. Yeah, I, w I wanted to try out the interaction with Jesse and me, but then again, Rick started introducing you. So I want to give you the, the microphone uh, right now, and then we have the discussion yeah, uh, afterwards. Let, let's, gather, <laughs> let's gather the other speakers, because now, uh, now we yeah. have uh, the jurisdiction of the United States. Let's uh, have the UK join in as well. Um, um, he has uh, studied uh, architecture um, and now is a head of design and co-founder at Axon Park. Um, you may know him from YouTube on his uh, talks on the metaverse as well. Alistair Hume. Hello, how's it going? So uh, how, how does the talk from uh, Jesse on uh, DA, DAOs sound to uh, your ears? Um, also, from a perspective of, of jurisdictions and your respective backgrounds, uh, Sarah and Alistair. Great question. Uh, Sarah, do you want to begin? Uh, sure. Can you repeat that question, Rick? So how do you respond to uh, Jesse's uh, talk on decentralized uh, autonomous organizations, uh, also from a pr perspective of jurisdictions? Um, because he mentioned that the U.S. Um, is getting ready uh, for it. Oh, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Um, we have one state, Wyoming, that is uh, pushed through legislation to recognize uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, so that is interesting. And Wyoming has actually been quite progressive in blockchain uh, since like 2016 or 2017 they've started adopting it for the agricultural products so that's really interesting there and we just had President Biden um, put forth a very encouraging document on crypto related research which <clears throat> I think um, we have folks in the U.S., especially in our governing bodies that are now concerned about being behind the curve with cryptocurrency, blockchain, and metaverse governance, and they don't want to lose out. So I think that's, that's important for us. And we also see the um, current global situations that are increasing the coverage on crypto and what it can do. So I think with these groups of people, non-government organizations, and not even organizations coming together to create support structures or governance structures uh, is, is really interesting. But I know the U.S. wants to have a positive uh, – relationship with crypto and the metaverse <clears throat> and yeah and uh, regarding the design community of jesse um 
Uh, Alistair, you are a head of design? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I might just very quickly add as well, I can't speak to the same level of precision with regards to the UK's legislation. But typically the UK takes an approach where it wants to be a really easy place to start scalable international business. So I would be typically optimistic that the regulations would come in relatively quickly as the uh, industry evolved. But I think I can speak very quickly to how much I feel we need it at the moment as someone who's experienced the last few years of the United Kingdom. Uh, obviously, in 2016, America had its own uh, set of things going on, but Britain's big one was Brexit. And for a lot of people, especially business people, we felt that we were being involuntarily divorced from a part of a culture we had grown into over the last 50 years. Uh, at the moment, for example, Taylor and I work together. He, he's based in Europe. I'm based in the United Kingdom. Taylor is the founder of Axon Park, just for context. And uh, through virtual reality and the metaverse, we basically can meet in a much more intuitive way than we would usually. So I'm very optimistic that the DAO framework will be something that can potentially allow a greater level of collaboration across borders than current business infrastructure does. That's, that's the thing that really, really excites me about it. So, so this gears towards a political stance that uh, uh, DAOs become a way to uh, overcome Brexit a bit? Uh, not just Brexit, but I think in general, the internet and subsequently the metaverse, the biggest thing it's doing is it's allowing people to cross borders culturally, uh, economically, more than ever before. It's been a journey we've been on as a planet for the last couple of centuries, definitely. But I think it's a really equitable mm. and exciting way to accelerate that to the next step. Um, so, yeah, it, it could definitely address some of the challenges Brexit has brought, regardless of what side of the kind of fancy fall on with opinion, I think. But beyond that as well, it's not just applicable in the UK, it's applicable in any country as a really fast way of working with others uh, beyond your kind of local infrastructure or, or local regulatory bodies. Yeah, thank you. Jorrit? Yeah, what I was... Uh... So wondering if if we relate it back to uh, all of Jess's uh, ambitions with setting up the, those uh, DAOs and uh, decentralized economies is what is the, the urgency, what is the need, why do we need to do it differently from, for example, a Facebook in Meta where this is not the case, but you can still set up your virtual business in Meta, you can still showcase your products. So all of the yeah. features within the metaverse is still possible within Meta. So uh, yeah, for uh, that's, Jess that's uh, a... to, uh, to challenge them. Yeah, this, I mean, to be quite honest, I don't know anybody in here that that wants a Facebook metaverse. I mean, like metaverse <laughs> yeah. to us are, are, are meant to be diverse, right? I think that that's part of the, the distributed mindset is that um, we, we just, we just want a level playing field for everybody. We're, we think, okay, so think about it this way. We think DAOs, you can create a structure, an organization as a DAO that can go head to head with any centralized web to business and you can 10X their profits overnight. Like seriously, this is, I mean, this is not a joke. We're, we're here talking about decentralized economies and you really want to know, like, just talk about the money. Forget the decentralization for a, cell, for a second. Just setting up an organization that's not really meant to take profits, but give all the profits back to the people. You cut out all the middle people. You 10x any business in the world and you can do it 10 times faster than any business in the world because most web two business centralized or public entities, they legally, mm -hmm. fiduciarily, and like they just can't do it. They can't do what DAOs can do. And so I think that's really our, our optimism about what DAOs can do is that quite frankly, we're co-founders of four different DAOs. So we see that, that these tactics can be applied to any business in the world and right now we're we're on the we're on a tear you you talked about why is there this sense of urgency well because we know we, we're fighting against 
decentralized models that already have the billions of dollars. And we think once you give a people the taste of getting profits off of the platforms that they use, there's no going back to giving up all your data and all your privacy for somebody else to monetize, right? This can kind of go back and now communities can inject all kinds of other value systems along next to the to the 10xing of, of the financials. Now, you know, because we're a creative community, we inject other things like equality, justice, sustainability, transparency, like all these things that we think are the future. We built for three years an organization around those values versus the singular value of any for-profit entity. Yeah. Okay, Just, so do that's you a bright have... approach for your uh, DAO. Uh, anyone from yeah. the audience, uh, are you interested in uh, the DAO uh, as an alternative uh, to a singular uh, corporate-driven uh, perspective? Any uh, oh. questions for... Uh, just... yeah, sorry, I can't see your name yet, but uh, you can just unmute yeah. yourself. It's Marco. Yeah. Marco, am I can can I be heard? Yes, yeah, am can. I being heard? Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, so I think um, uh, uh, with a word of caution, because uh, the word economy I think is very important here. Uh, uh, decentralized doesn't mean equalitarian, right? And I think uh, uh, in the Wild West it was decentralized, but it was the people who turned up with uh, a lot of money behind them already the ones who were able to stake their, their territory first and uh, control everyone else. And under the promise of a, a brand new world, a lot of people went to make their fortune and ended up working in the railway railroads and working on the uh, panhandling, trying to look for gold. <clears throat> so I guess my point is that <clears throat> um, an organiza a decentralized organization is not a promise of equalitarian access to everyone. And you do, in fact, get a lot of people, individuals with a lot of money who are able to uh, immediately buy uh, land or buy territory or buy uh, goods that other people will have to work in order to uh, to get anywhere. So okay. how do so, we so ensure that... is one step, but it's not sufficient for you? Correct. Correct. Organization is one thing, but ensuring that there's access for everyone is is quite another and uh, jesse how are you dealing with uh, uh, access in your uh, design community yeah so think that so we think of medium as the public option like um we see everything i come from the footwear industry so i was a designer design director for 10 years over at Adidas. I've, you know, designed with the biggest and best, uh, design, you know, designers as well as um, athletes and influencers and rappers and all that stuff. Um, absolutely. Uh, it's not, there's not a level playing field um, in the old system, but I think that that's what we're so optimistic about. Um, and that's kind of what I was talking about, about the values. We get to construct whole new economic models um, and, and you know Sarah knows a bit about our economic model like it's um, it's so advantageous on the financial side but but that's where we think any web to business just applying the tools or the mindsets of centralization of web 3 will at best get to like web 2.5. But to get to Web3, you have to have the decentralized distributed mindset. And in our case, being a design organization, equality, I, you know, I stated equality, I stated kind of some of our values before, before the question of, of equality, sustainability, transparency, justice, right? Like we're trying to tear down all the isms that divide people and put everybody on a level playing field and then let talent basically bubble up from the surface. It's still free market economics in terms of what people are gonna buy, sell and trade. You still gotta drive demand. Um, but at the end of the day, if everybody has, like for instance, um, we've, got a, we've got a strategic partnership with the Global Blockchain Initiative and Ben Balderati um, and Tyler Penning 
And what we're doing there is free education, free global education in 125 countries. And there's 4,000 students in the first session. Um, so we're providing courses and design thinking courses and, and doing all of that stuff. So we think, yeah, you've got to train all these people that are right now stuck in Web 2. Everybody's going to transition at some place to Web 3. We need to build those real equitable bridges into Web 3. Okay, so what's the next Thanks. step according to uh, our peers? Uh, Alistair, Sarah? Uh, Sarah, do you want to go? Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, you know, I sure. do know a bit about the economic structure of Medium. And one of the things that uh, may be unique to the U.S. and I, I really like about Medium is that so we don't have like a commonwealth uh, health care. <clears throat> you basically health care is very expensive and it's usually provided by an employer. And a lot of times people stay at their job because uh, of health care. They get those benefits through work. So something that Medium is doing is <clears throat> it has a collective uh, group pay system where as an individual contributor to their group, you can buy into that healthcare system so you no longer are dependent on a government uh, or ex not government but an employer based healthcare which gives people freedom I, I know that for a long time I've stayed at jobs because of the benefits which is mainly healthcare because as an individual purchaser it's really expensive uh, so that is one way to solve things but I think that when people start talking about disparities in the metaverse, um, it, it's important to remember that there are still almost a billion people on the planet that do not have power. They don't have electricity. So just being able to have this headset and be here, we're privileged. We we are we have wealth that that others don't. And uh, I think is so, nodding to that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, sorry, please continue. Oh, no, that's good. Uh, I, that's kind of what I wanted to say. Um, mm. Thank you. Yeah, I might very quickly I add as well. Um, I can't I can't uh, kind of address the kind of economics in quite the same level of specificity. But what we do in our business is we're all about accessibility. And the easiest first step is just to really teach people what can be done in the metaverse, whether it's tools, whether it's just sharing information and basically saying, look, you know, from your background, here are ways you might be able to engage. Uh, I, th I think that one of the biggest barriers to equality or equity in this space is probably uh, lack of information for a lot of different people. All you see is online people getting rich with things like virtual land, which I think Yorit is going to have a thing or two to say about that later. But um, and suddenly they think the only way to get into the metaverse is to quickly buy in now and invest in something that someone else has already made rather than potentially ask the question what do i do and how could i bring that into the space so i think i think information is a really good place to start and then beyond that i think exactly what you guys are doing which is kind of building platforms and frameworks for people to engage without being beholden to someone else's framework or contract is a really really powerful thing to address exactly what the question raised which is if we're not careful we're just going to build new economic systems to feed into rather than new ways to kind of uh, build a livelihood for ourselves so yeah no um yeah th thank you very much for your perspective yeah and and i think, okay, I think... Not now, Jared. sorry rick Jared, if you, uh, Jared, uh, you yeah i think that, that i think this is also a very nice bridge actually to the second topic which is now already on the screen the yeah. wealth disparity in the metaverse so what i really agree with jessa uh, is that you know, Web3 is a great tool for the creator economy, right? So it takes wealth, let's say, from the, uh, from the rich and it distributes that wealth to the creatives. So that way it's, 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 it's an amazing tool. So anyone who is able to craft something on his computer, on his laptop can make money. So that's a way to uh, really stimulate that creator economy. But I think the disparity problem, as Marco also mentioned, is not yet solved and it can perhaps be solved by having by building DAOs with uh, uh, common values, common 
uh, uh, common attributes, perhaps in including some kind of mechanics that take account uh, of this. But that's still, you know, a, a topic I think we should really discuss. And and that brings us, I think, well, to the wealth disparity. In immediately, uh, uh, yeah. We can do that with uh, someone who has a um, background in uh, the public sector um, and uh, currently working as an economic consultant uh, at large, uh, Sarah. Uh, what's your view on the wealth disparity? Uh, so yeah. is the universe only for the wealthy? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. I actually was listening. We, there's a modern day philosopher. His name is Jason Silva. Some of you may have uh, heard of him or seen him on Instagram. Uh, but he recently posted something that I wanted to share. Uh, and it's he said he starts out. It is said that when we dream, we get to work out our stuff, work through problems, uh, use simulations. Our mind is unconstrained by reality, so it can practice, take risks. It can consolidate, learn, explore, and it can experiment. And this happens every night, individually. Uh, and he was speaking with someone. He had some to the metaverse to a kind of collective dreamscape where we can collectively run simulations, work out problems, explore, create new governance systems and new economies. So I think that there are a group. Uh, I, I mean, you would have to define disparity to say something, but there are, Unity is open source. You can build if you want. Uh, you have to have a computer to be able to have Unity. Uh, but there are fashion designers. I helped a couple friends mint their NFTs on HEN, which is a creator platform. It's very affordable to buy NFTs there. You're not getting like the million dollar or ten million dollar NFT drops is it's a place where artists and art appreciators can go uh, and I really do think there is something for everyone here in, in the metaverse it, it's finding it, it's it's finding what your interests are but I've been to meditation groups that are free and open to everyone which is really cool normally if if you were doing an in-person meditation you probably have to pay 20 to 50 us dollars to join that group uh, i've been into rooms where they were teaching people for free how to build in unity so i think that this disparity probably is really in available time to learn and, and not necessarily in, in accessibility. Yeah, what about uh, your peers, um, Jesse? What's, an, uh, what's a promising uh, initiative on uh, battling the wealth disparity in the metaverse? Uh, I, so I guess there, that there's so many words up on that screen that are kind of big topics in themselves. So, um, you know, like, how do you define wealth, right? As well, because I, I guess I talked about already that wealth in the old, what we call the old system, right? The system up to today was how many dollars or your equivalency fiat money you have in your bank account. And then what type of lifestyle that affords you. But in the metaverse, doesn't everybody get to kind of remake their own lifestyle and their own um, vision of kind of the way that they want to live? And so I think that there's automatic when you go from like physicality. I mean, you look at like Ready Player One, right? Like something like that, where the world is dead and dilapidated, but people are very wealthy in the metaverse. Um, like, is that what we're talking about? Because I guess in our eyes, um, I guess wealth disparity, you, you kind of have to think about, man, I mean, I'm talking to people in this space that are just literally all over the globe. Like, I mean, I'm sure everybody, I'm sure there's every co continent, maybe minus Antarctica present in this room, right? Like that right there, there's so much wealth in communities because communities are what provide us, the people that are part of that community, 
with what we need to live or what we like to live and, and, and other things. So I think it's just a really complex question of like w like wealth disparity. I guess we're trying to, to lower the bar of entry to zero, right? We say you have to have a curiosity in the internet. Like, like yes, that cuts out some people in the world, but as long as you have curiosity, there are free tools out there. There's free education. The barrier to entry should be super low. I think that's a little different. People trying to get into the metaverse for for other reasons than just collecting NFTs or just collecting land. Yes, we see that right now a lot of people that already have a lot of fiat money and they're just parlaying it over here. So that's just kind of this weird transition of value or wealth into a new system, but it's still the same players. But we think that that's going to be short lived once people, once more and more people on board into this space and just even introducing people to the metaverse by a conference like this, like all of a sudden people start to feel more comfortable with the concept of metaverse, right? So there's these, all these micro things that kind of have to happen to, to um, onboard all these new people. And it's not always wealth in terms of financial dollars that separates the difference. Okay, mm. so with regard to this uh, wealth disparity issue, uh, what's a pressing issue you want to have uh, discussed anyone uh, from the team or from the audience I, I actually think that the decentralized identities the dids and being able to choose who you share your data with and who compensates you for that data will reduce some disparities uh, and I, I think that is a, an interesting topic mm. and that if anyone else has an opinion on that, Jorit looks like he might. Jorit. Yeah, sure. I'd like to challenge Jess uh, on the topic of the definition of wealth because I agree in the sense that you know the your your uh, your well-being um, is very important and you can uh, stimulate that by uh, with, with your community, with your environment. Uh, with all of the social responsibilities you take care of. However, wealth is really an economic question. So it's really expressed in L3 is that your possessions are really yours. They are not controlled by this intermediary uh, party. It's really controlled by, by you. And it's often coupled... Uh, to your identity as well. So that means that in this Web3 world, things become a lot more important suddenly. So, m for example, okay, let's, um, let, yeah. Let's have, have uh, two examples. One uh, example you had in sure. mind and then uh, from the pharmacy practice, but uh, first yours. Yeah, yeah. So the the pharmacy one from Arun is, uh, is definitely a good one. Um, but but the first, uh, the first example that I come up with is, uh, especially you see that in DAOs and early crypto projects in, in the whole uh, Web3 community, is that if you are not part of it, you will lose out in the long term. So you see this uh, necessity of you going into the metaverse, which is almost like, um, if it's, it's more like a FOMO, a fear of missing out, rather than going voluntarily in uh, in in this this metaverse and i while i agree that there are a lot of uh, places where you can have free collaboration free, free community um there are also events communities etc where a minimum amount of tokens or an nft is required to access uh, specific experiences of or content so there's yeah, so definitely those are barriers, this uh, barriers to entry so to say yeah, so those are definitely barriers to entry, and um, you know, if you if you take it back to the roots of the the internet, the internet was basically a free place for everyone, and everyone is able to share content. It's really focused on attention spans, but now the attention spans are directly coupled to the dopamine syst system in terms of gamification, and then as well to the financial system. So you yeah, really as quickly as can as get in dopamine. Uh, you're it. If you, as soon as yes. You dopamine, nice bridge. Uh, Alistair grabbed his head. Um, so one <laughs> last point on this topic, Alistair. 
Yeah, sorry, I was just going to very quickly add as well, uh, just to throw another perspective into the ring. Um, the way I often look at wealth, whether inside or outside of the metaverse, is agency. What in your life do you have control over? Do you have control over the way you shelter yourself? Or is it something that is very difficult to manage like it is in a lot of the world at the moment? Do you have control over the way you live your life? Or do you have to work every day to feed yourself to make sure you don't materially damage yourself? Um, and in the real world at the moment, we're experiencing a tremendous amount of wealth inequality and a huge amount of the world doesn't have either spatial or day-to-day -day agency. Um, and I think at the very least in the metaverse, there is the potential to, as Jesse says, lower the barrier to entry in terms of what things cost so that you do have, say, for example, a lot more spatial agency, more agency of how you express yourself or who you connect to. So a lot of the traditional barriers of were you born into the right family? Did you go to the right school? Do you know the right people can be bypassed in a space like this where we are somewhat more on a level playing field outside of the areas right now where it is just an extension or a reflection of existing wealth being brought into the space? The thing that really excites me is in the long run, will access to the metaverse, which I hope will become ubiquitous over time, allow people to have more agency as well in the real world? Because these two worlds do massively relate. Yep, so, um, so I'm really hoping that more accessible information, a higher quality of conversation around how we shape our space and who we connect to can have positive feedback into the way we live our lives and think about our lives in the real world as well. Uh, and I think that'll take a very long time to happen, but that's definitely something that I focus on very heavily because the real world is not going anywhere and we do need to continue to make sure we take care of each other in it. Okay, so uh, way beyond uh, sheer financial or monetary um monetary disparities and uh, there's also um, control uh, ownership uh, accessibility these are the topics uh, you've all addressed clearly let's uh, hear from the pharmacy practice uh, how they deal uh, with uh, these issues uh, in a concept called social prescribing uh, representing the Social Prescribing uh, Pharmacy Association, uh, an evangelist uh, in that sense. Uh, he's also a, an ambassador for your open metaverse, Arun Nada Rasa. So, hi everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. So thank you so much for the introduction. So I just want to cover two topics which is relevant to the economy, in, especially when it comes down to DAO. So for me, the way I look at it, on how DAO could impact the health industry is two in two aspects of it. So the first angle is, for example, the current Web2 organization, like Jesse described, is in a sense got different entities aligned. So for example, me as a pharmacist, I've got into the profession in order to improve the health and well-being of the patient. But then my employer will tell me that actually I want you to focus on providing more medicine to the patient because that's how they get more money. So that's currently the current model of care in UK. The more medicine I give to the patient, the more money I give to the organization, and then I get the money. And for me, sometimes some of the decisions I make is unethical, which has got me into trouble in the past time, which is why I kind of shifted my attention towards social prescribing, which is a prescribing of non-medicinal activities for the patient, which can include financial advice, uh, housing advice, gambling addiction support, in that aspect, there could be in the future a DAO supporting hiring directly pharmacists who will be getting monthly payment depending on the amount of health improvements they've made to the patient. So basically, the mission statement of the DAO they hired with is all about improvement of patient health and well-being, not about providing as much medicine, which is currently aligned with the initiative of Web2 organization. And the second part of it is regarding health workers that work directly with the patient for funding provision. So in UK, there is a system called Link Worker, and basically there's this person who go to the patient house, speak with them for three to four hours to create a personal care plan, and if that person needs financial advice or housing advice, they refer that person to the relevant organization, but also can ask for grant to, for example, break, uh, repair the broken windows of the patient that may be suffering from hypothermia. And this is it could be fast-tracked using a DAO where there's a link worker going as a proposal to the token holders of the DAO to request a funding to fix the broken windows of that 80 year old woman house. So that was my two minutes talk and I do a press count all the time. So thank you. 
Thank you very much. And uh, those of us interested in hearing more about social prescribing, just uh, have a look on uh, Arun's uh, profile, Arun Nadarasa. Thank you very much. Um, well, then, now that we've uh, addressed the topic of wealth uh, from one perspective of accessibility uh, and community, let's uh, have a look at the uh, money making machine that the metaverse might be for some or for all. Let's hear about uh, this topic uh, revenues for. People and business. Uh, Alistair Yu. Hello. Yeah, sure. So I, I want to basically preface this with my background. So I came from architecture originally, uh, back in the day when virtual reality was just starting to release with the early Oculus dev kits. And I joined this industry because I thought so many of the spatial and infrastructural questions of our world weren't going to be necessarily addressed in the real world in the coming decades. It was going to be addressed in digital space. And at the time, no one really knew what I was talking about, so it took a while to make that transition. And now, all of a sudden, we're seeing a lot of engineers and architects and real estate people suddenly ask, how can I get involved and how can I bring what I do into this new space? And it's, it's basically a way of asking, are there ways to generate revenue and offer my skills in the metaverse? Um, so, so far today, we've seen a lot of amazing new ways of structuring businesses, new ways of kind of selling products. But at the moment, we do have billions of people in the world. And, you know, a lot of them have existing industries and skill sets that they're in. So what is that? What of that is going to be potentially able to be brought into the metaverse and basically reframed in a new way, similar to what happened when the Internet first came online? A few of you in here might remember back in the early days of the Internet, people were saying, it's never going to make any money. We don't even know how to monetize it. It's just a fad and a way to get a little bit of news. Maybe some people might subscribe to the New York Times. And then all of a sudden, people realized you could advertise and you could sell products. And every single business on the planet was paying consultants millions of dollars to say, how can we take what we're doing and bring it into the internet? And in so doing, a uh, 100 different industries, a 1,000 different industries were transformed in terms of the way that they do business. So yes, there's always new ways of generating revenue based on uh, new business models that have only just been enabled uh, by this new technology, but there's also potentially a lot of ways to bring existing businesses and industries into the metaverse. So I'm co-founder of a virtual reality and metaverse education company called Axon Park. So our long-term goal is to basically make education a fundamental human right for everyone uh, and lower the barrier to access of education to the point where no matter who you are in the world, you will know that you have access to world-class learning to achieve what you want to achieve. Um, and to do that, we need to get the entire education industry involved. There are millions of fantastic teachers and educators around the world who are, are brilliant at what they do, which is helping future generations to learn and understand, but might not necessarily understand how to bring that skill set into the metaverse. So a lot of what we've been doing in the early stage is basically teaching people within the industry how they could train in the metaverse. What is the metaverse? Um, how would you build for it? How would your skill set uh, translate? Um, so we've done things like, for example, uh, Taylor, the founder, and I gave a talk last week. Or was it the week before? One or the other at the University of Harvard. Uh, and basically teaching the next generation of students how they might be able to bring their own skills into the metaverse. What we learned at the time was that they all found it really inaccessible and scary. A lot of them thought it was just crypto and virtual lands and people getting rich quick, but everyone else missing out. And what they didn't realize was it was potentially a new way to communicate or a new way to meet people, or a new way to potentially do business and uh, offer services. Um, it's, it's basically been at this stage asking people what of your kind of existing economy can be shared in a decentralized manner, whether or not it's representing products, uh, whether or not it's meeting people and kind of offering decentralized or, or kind of remote services, whether or not it's as we're doing education, which is for the most part, something you can do really, really well in virtual space. Obviously there are things that have to be done in the physical world, but doing a lot of it in virtual space really reduces, either reduces the barrier to access for kind of getting in, or heavily, heavily improves the quality compared to let's say, for example, a conference call. Um, there's any so other yeah. ways to make but, living in the metaverse uh, uh, anyone else would like to highlight for either mm. people or uh, businesses? S say again, sorry, please. 
So any other ways uh, to make a living in the metaverse uh, you would like to highlight? Um, any of your peers? Yeah, Jesse, sure. Sarah? So in, um, I, I can quickly address that. So in the short term, at the moment, the biggest ones outside of getting involved with crypto are probably creators in the metaverse. So it's building the platform as an engineer, an XR engineer, or it's building the world as a world builder. It basically has a blend of the skill set of something like an architect and something like an environment designer for a video game. And it's, but it's a new way of framing those skills and sharing to others. We're still definitely at the stage for a lot of these platforms where they are being built. So those are some really early ones. But then beyond that, it's a case of, right, well, what are you trying to offer in the metaverse? Let's say, for example, uh, uh, this, this uh, talk today and the ones following are using PWC's uh, framework for understanding the metaverse. That's a, one of the biggest companies on the planet is trying to understand how it can work with as many industries as they're involved in to bring people into the metaverse. I think at the moment, the biggest barrier to access for most people outside of the industry is platform. Um, it's a question of how do we offer our skills in here. For example, the Walmart metaverse was making the news a few weeks ago. Um, and what did it end up being? It ended up being a virtual reality simulator of people shopping with the word metaverse strapped to it. Um, now, in my opinion, that wasn't necessarily the uh, most kind of cogent or forward-thinking way of applying that. But that was a company completely outside of what we're doing, asking how they can get involved. Um, so really, I think the big thing is... At this stage, working with companies to show them how they could kind of work with platforms, whether or not it's something, an open platform like Spatial or a custom platform, and basically saying, how can we communicate what we do to others uh, throughout the metaverse? And then hopefully through that, the economy will kind of evolve over time and new use cases will definitely evolve over time. You know, we haven't yeah. seen, for so example, now, the Twitter metaverse. So, uh, Alistair, so, so mm. now that these uh, big players are interested, PwC, Walmart, um, what's mm -hmm. a way to uh, make this uh, metaverse economy more inclusive? Jorrit? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's definitely a very good question. I mean... Um, I, I'm to be honest. I'm not really sure about the the inclusive aspects relating to to wealth. I mean, in a way, uh, via play to earn mechanics, you can uh, distribute wealth easily to people who don't uh, have the money to invest uh, in it. So there are multiple structures that you can use, multiple revenue um, uh, revenue models you can use also as a brand to employ in new ways. For example, in the past, in Facebook and in Google, a brand was paying Facebook or Google to advertise their product. But now, with the play-to-earn mod uh, revenue models, a brand can reward individual users to, uh, to brand their product. So that way, you get a direct interaction between the brand and the promoter of the brand, which can be anywhere across the world. So... Uh, which is a completely new way of, uh, of of thinking, and that's you know one. Uh, so so that's part of the the play to earn mechanic, which is a very important in the in the metaverse. And, and another way of thinking about it is um, so we have uh, at your open metaverse we have to defined a new type of NFT, which is a chargeable, where you can charge your NFT with certain tokens or with other NFTs. That way, the properties of the NFT actually change depending on the amount of tokens you send to it, and that could also form a basis of very or a very easy way to create a DAO out of a out of a single singular NFT that is equipable. So not only is your membership as a DAO, you know, an abstract concept, it now becomes an item that you can wear. And the more member you are, the more stake you have in the DAO the faster you can walk, for example. So that really mm -hmm. redefines, let's say, the properties of what a DAO can be. Um, so this is, of course, coming, coming back again from, uh, you know, opportunities uh, for, for, uh, for DAOs. But for individual, uh, you know, businesses, there are many ways okay. to, to uh, 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 you know, set, a, set up your virtual venues. And, uh, you, you know, another way is to really build your own, a virtual venue that you lease out to performers or um, users 
uh, you know, as part of, okay, uh, right. of a so, larger event. So we can say that, that beyond the examples uh, shared by your peers, uh, uh, promoting uh, products, uh, creating, uh, maybe uh, maybe even by playing, uh, then the next step to okay. earn money okay. in the metaverse. Uh, metaverse. Uh, is uh, Sarah? Sarah, any other ways you want to highlight? for people or businesses uh, to uh, make a living? Not sure whether our economist is still connected. Yes, no, she is. Maybe someone else will go first, thank you. Sorry, I wanted to just say something. Yep. Mm. Well, um, I'm in the audience. I don't know. Yeah, yeah please, please. Uh, well, something that hasn't been mentioned yet, but is uh, is the emergence of uh, GameFi guilds, and I think that uh, GameFi guilds are only the start. But uh, what you see happening there is that uh, in the Philippines, for example, uh, XI Infinity is a crypto game that's uh, very popular, and uh, you see that, uh, that there there was the need or there is an interest by some of the gamers to have a character in that game called XI, the main protagonist. Uh, and if you have that character, you're better able to play the game and you can have higher earnings in terms of crypto. Now, for some people, that would be an upfront investment that's not available to them. But with GameFi guilds, and that's where it started, the guild actually enabled players to yeah. rent an XI character from another player in the game and thereby uh, engage in those higher earnings earnings with those characters. Uh, game, gaming guilds, GameFi guilds have grown beyond that. I mean, the biggest GameFi guild in the world already has a, uh, uh, a 350 million in assets, in crypto assets. And what they're also doing now is, for example, providing hardware for gamers in, in places that are, you know, where people are with lower wealth levels that would otherwise not be able to participate and engage. Uh, through the guild, they can uh, rent or temporarily get hardware and virtual assets that allow them to partake uh, here and then start earning uh, uh, earning crypto assets. So I, I think this is a very interesting development and I think that yeah, we'll start with GameFi uh, and then yeah. move on. So these uh, gamers guilds are an example also of uh, making a living uh, through the metaverse. Uh, so we're going to teach our kids to uh, uh, promote, create, play and uh, what what not, uh, Alistair, to wrap up? Yeah, uh, the very the quick thing I'd quickly add as well is, if you again think back to the internet, the biggest winners from the internet weren't existing companies like, say, for example, IBM, uh, although Apple and Microsoft did do very well. A lot of the biggest new things were small groups with interesting ideas and new ways to take on the technology or new ways to use the technology. Google, Twitter, YouTube, etc. right? Um, and I think we're definitely going to see that again. I don't don't know if we've yet seen the equivalent in metaverses or if there even will be or if it'll be a lot more decentralized but we have access to a lot of really great tools to start so at the moment things like unreal engine unity are a great way for people to just learn to create there are tutorials out there and you can figure out how to build things in them so if, you, if you've got a cool idea for something to do in the metaverse it's probably easier than it's ever been in the past to start prototyping right now and seeing how it goes and getting it in front of people um and then beyond that yeah, just just keep getting involved. Um, I, I think I think kind of game yeah. is a really great one. Um, it's a really great example. But I bet yeah. there are ten thousand others out there that no one's even thought of, and the tools to start messing around with them exist today. So yeah, um, if if you're into that, or if you have a great idea, get cracking. Yeah, and uh, who knows uh, where Exxon Park will be in this uh, new economy? Yeah, hit us up. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. And then. Uh, and another uh, prospective career for our kids in the in the metaverse is uh, virtual real estate agents. Uh, time for your rent, Jorrit. Yeah, exactly. I think the the um, yeah. So before before I start, let me give a little bit of context. So at your open metaverse, we uh, started off basically as a as a, a content creation platform for the future. So we looked at all of the metaverses out there and we thought, okay, how do we connect, let's say, existing individuals, content creators to that, to that metaverse? And we encountered, uh, you know, several, several issues. Um, so some of them were really fundamental in the way how content is stored and uh, distributed and others were, you know, more like short-term uh, uh, 
challenges that we had to deal with. And that, you know, for us, that was really also the reason why we decided to uh, create this new platform that um, attempts at least to um, challenge the one of the most fundamental problems at the moment in the metaverse. And that fundamental problem is the sale of real estate. And why, why is that the case? Because, you know, with, uh, so, so before I go into that, I'd like to ask uh, the audience, uh, who of you has some real estate in a metaverse somewhere? Is there yeah, anyone? So who are the moguls? <laughs> who are the moguls? Who are the moguls? Real estate in the in I, the I see one there. <laughs> like basil. Can you, can you elaborate uh, upon your uh, real estate uh, portfolio? Are you talking talking to me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Yeah, I have some uh, some land actually in Decentraland and some land in Pavia. That's it's on the Cardano blockchain. Okay, that's uh, that's. And are you uh, are you happy with it? Uh, yes, I mean I, I bought it because I I want to uh, make a retail store in the future, and we're working together for um, for companies uh, in, in Texas, actually a, a coffee producer yeah. to to make uh, buildings in the metaverse. So that's why we are involved in uh, in this. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I see I see two things. I see that. You know, one of them is there. There's definitely a need for real estate. There's a need to, you know, launch your virtual venue, as you as you're saying that you're trying to set up this virtual shop. The other one is a more technical problem, and that problem is more about composability. So where is that uh, a piece of land stored? Well, it's simple. It's in the end, it's all stored on a server somewhere, and that's why. nice virtual rack here uh, the <laughs> land that you bought so what that means is that if the servers go down or if um you know the the platform upgrades to another game world that has a different distribution of land um then you're stuck with that land that is then not being maintained anymore so there are a lot of patches involved um, regarding the co composability of that land, um, you know, an another uh, issue would be, let's say, the environment changes in uh, the central land. So uh, one of the creators decides to, you know, uh, change around the sky or plants a big tree where you don't want it. You get some disputes and you have to res uh, resolve that. So there are, you know, many, many issues at stake here. And that's why together with Alistair, I mean, there was... I think there was a brainstorm about one year ago where we discussed mm. this topic and we decided, yeah. okay, there should be, you know, a new way of thinking about it. And uh, Alistair already introduced in one of his videos the, uh, the topic or at least the concept of meta spaces where it's not a piece of land that is stored in a bigger game server that is stored on a server somewhere. No, it's a space that is actually hosted by you. It's maintained by you. It's uh, It can be turned off by you. It can com be completely changed around uh, by you. And you can have complete control of all of the data that is on that game server. Because the moment you say, I'm going to build my virtual venue on, let's say, the central land, and I'm going to buy that real estate, you're also saying all of the data of that virtual venue is now part of the central land, is now owned, is now stored somewhere on the game servers of the central land. And that is uh, a big issue. If you really want to go into Web3 about ownership, then you have to make sure that that composability, that that uh, tie between where the data is stored and uh, uh, the you know the level itself is um, is connected. Um, you know, so so that is a big uh, big major challenge that we're seeing in the space right now, and that's why we decided to come up with your open metaverse, where you as a business owner can uh, create your own venue. For example, in Unreal Engine, you can sculpt it to your liking. There are already great tools to do that, and then using our platform, you can deploy that on the cloud and you can embed it, for example, on your own website, you can host it uh, 
anywhere you like. You can also, you know, ma make it part of our uh, our own uh, gateways. You can distribute it to YouTube, and that way you are really control of your own data, of your own uh, landscape. You can turn it off whether you want it or not. You can. Uh, so the drawback is you do have to pay for the hosting costs. So if you um, cannot crowdfund or monetize your Metaspace, it will go down. But that makes sense because that also is a trigger for you to start thinking about the revenue models, about a business model in in the you know in the metaverse. And, and yeah, I'd like to really discuss this topic also with the other uh, experts here because. Um, I know that Alistair is a fan, so I don't think there is a much discussion there, but uh, apparently, uh, you know, we have some other experts here, so uh, perhaps yeah. we can uh, we can discuss that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, but, uh, uh, so it's good. The role of it's, it's, lens. What's your it's good to know Je Jesse had a heart, uh, or he needed to le leave at 5 uh, Central European time, so I don't know if he's still here, but just uh, that you know at, at least we have a gentleman uh, uh, with uh, short hair and uh, uh, on the on the third row uh, you raise your hand yeah yeah sorry we cannot uh, we cannot see your names that that would help a bit that's just a tip I for uh, spatial, maybe. Needed. What about uh, Sarah? On virtual lands, uh, what are uh, your views on the issues uh, you already raised? Connections um, okay. are a bit I can very quickly fill the silence if we need while other people figure some stuff out. Um, I, I, do you mind if I add something quickly? Sure. Thanks. Yes, please. So, yeah, basically just to kind of reflect what Yorick was saying, uh, the question that I would ask everyone is, in the real world, where does the value of land come from? Um, thank you, thank it's you. Slightly rhetorical, but there's a million different variables, but the big ones are th that I would highlight are the scarcity of land, the fact that we only have a finite amount, and the adjacency. So, you know, where is the land near services, people, other businesses, geographic locations, right? And those are the two main things amongst a myriad of others that kind of underpin the land economics of the real world. Um, so the question that Yorit and I and many others have been asking over the last year is, what is the land economics of the metaverse? Where theoretically, the amount of land we could create is absolutely limitless. So we're seeing a lot of platforms at the moment, virtual land platforms, that are basically saying, right, we're going to release a number of plots of land, and this is how much they're worth. And to some extent, they're, they're doing it in a really good way because they're building in adjacency. But in another sense, they are basically saying, look, okay, here's how land works in the real world, and now it's digital. So the thing that I think uh, your open metaverse is doing really well is they're basically saying the initial value is underpinned by what you want to put in it, right? It's exactly like YouTube. YouTube is, for me, a really fantastic analog for this. There are an unlimited number of video listings. You can upload as much as you want, but the value comes from the engagement, the views, the following, the content on the video, right? That's a kind of really good explainer of where value for, uh, comes for something if, you know, the commodity is effectively limitless. Um, so I would liken that in the metaverse to what kind of worlds are you building? Uh, what are you going to do with them? How are you going to encourage people to come in and experience something? And then beyond that, the adjacency comes from, right, okay, now, you know, this initially kind of basically worthless plot of land, it has some amazing stuff. What are you going to put next to it? Is it going to be your thing? Is it going to be someone else's? So almost in the way that villages and towns used to evolve in the old days, in medieval times, before we started planning out massive cities, I think metaspaces will eventually start networking and connecting together to become wider, bigger environments rather than starting with a great big empty plot of land and asking people to put stuff in them. Um, that's, that's the way around that I would approach things, is let things grow organically how they want. Don't force things into a mold like we have to in the real world. So you've uh, turned your architecture studies upside down. Hell yeah. <laughs>
Sarah, to wrap up, uh, Sarah. Oh yeah, I I just wanted to. Can you hear me now? Is this working? Yep. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> uh, Jorit was talking about uh, your if you build something in Decentraland, they own it, and <clears throat> you can see that now. I had an experience there, uh, not Decentraland. I was in Alt Space uh, speaking with someone, and they had built this elaborate world within Alt Space, and then Alt Space made an update. And it deleted a bunch of worlds. Uh, it was like the worst update ever. It happened a couple years ago. And a lot of things were deleted there. <clears throat> so he said he now only builds his worlds like in Unity. Or uh, I think he was actually in uh, Unreal Engine. So he, he has the program on his own computer. And then can load that world into other universes. And I, I really think that... Is comparable to what Jorit was speaking about is that if, if you build your own metaverse or your own meta space, then you have control over it. Uh, if someone does do an update or an upgrade or a fork, your all is not lost. So that's super interesting. Um, and that's it for me. Yeah, yeah Thank I, you very I much. think that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think that that's exactly the the, the problem, uh, Sarah. In the sorry, sorry, Rick. Um, so the, the the question is, of course, how do we uh, choose the engine? What kind of you know thresholds are there in in, in terms of uh, difficulty accessibility? Because suddenly, as a user, you should also not only think about creating those nice game environments somewhere. But you should also own it somewhere on your computer. You should think about deployment. You should think you should think about costs. And you know, quickly it becomes a whole lot more difficult to host your plot of land somewhere uh, than, of course, when you just say, "Okay, the central land is going to maintain it." Uh, but an even deeper deeper struggle is if you say, "Okay, I let the central land control it," then the central land is also bound to keep your land up forever. Because if at some point in 10 years they say, okay, the engine that we're working with is outdated, they should still support it. They should still host it somewhere in the server. And that's a big limitation because then you're not only, um, you know, limiting, um, uh, let's say the possibilities in that space, but, but you're actually saying we're just completely lock in um, innovation in that environment so that we cannot uh, go beyond that uh, level that uh, is co-created by all of those different businesses that uh, that, that are running in that uh, in, 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 in that meta space um, so that's why I think it's very dangerous that we commit or lock in let's say lock in uh, actual businesses uh, uh, like yourself uh, Basel, where you say I'm going to launch my virtual venue on the central land, when the central land, ah, perhaps in 10 years, is not relevant anymore, and then you're still stuck with all of the investments and costs that you made of uh, purchasing that piece of land and building up your venue, um, and then I'm not even talking about that for your customer funnel, you have to basically send all of your users and purchasers to uh, a third-party gateway, uh, namely Decentraland.com, where they have to purchase okay, or yeah, interact yeah. with your virtual business. So, okay, yeah, but, uh, so, uh, hence uh, the rack uh, of uh, the server rack you've uh, brought uh, to the table. <laughs> Very clear. Um, what about the landowner? We've heard from before. Uh, uh, does this uh, future also concern you? <clears throat> Hey, uh, yeah, thank you actually for all the information. I think it's very interesting to hear from other people about it because I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just in the space of all the people that are really into it. And they're strong believers. And so I'm surrounded by all, all these people. And then I barely think about all the consequences or the, the risk that it might have. Um, so I think it's very interesting and also to hear about uh, where the, the value is in. I mean, I, I know where the value is in. I, I look obviously at what's, what is surrounding me, 
but I, I yeah, I, I think it's very interesting what everyone said in, in this call so far about virtual land. Um, uh, luckily for myself, before we upload anything into the metaverse, we have everything um, saved as a 3D model. So if there would be any chance of, um, just like you said, uh, there was an update and you're losing your 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 piece your work basically so that would still be there and the nice thing about it is that i could also upload it in in any metaverse even in in spatial for example because it's just a 3d model okay basil thank you very much uh, for adding your experience uh, that's what makes uh, your open metaverse uh, a, a metaverse community that's uh, what uh, they gear towards uh, let's uh, continue that in this spirit uh, in the coming uh, series uh, because this is the first of sex uh, the first of six uh, uh, lectures or uh, discussions on the future of the metaverse uh, each dedicated to one topic uh, this one to the economy thanks to Alistair Hume Jesse Rademacher Sarah Honeycutt Jorrit Velzeboer and Arun Nadarasa And uh, conveners, and uh, usually we would have had a group hug, of course. Uh, now our <laughs> avatars can do so. Um, uh, come, come up front, um, uh, Daniel yeah. and Jorrit. Please uh, come here and uh, give sure. us. A <laughs> yeah, I, I, nice. I can't go lower. I'm yeah. stuck, floating. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> nice. <laughs> but this one maybe maybe make it good. Good. You look like you maybe. look like a god. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm the meta. I'm the ultimate meta god. <laughs> hey, I, have a, I have a selfie stick here. Maybe we can make a... Yeah, like this. You're a meta god. Yeah. Bring him down. Just pull, it, pull him stage. down with your selfie hey, stick. Open real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we turn that way? Okay, should we... Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it doesn't work. I already work? tried resetting there everything. Oh. Resetting the headset. Cool. Okay. Uh, so uh, if everyone from the audience would like to join in with the group selfie, maybe that's uh, a cool idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so please oh, yeah. go uh, behind me. I want to stand, I wanna stand next to Alistar. Can I stand next to Alistar? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Nice. Uh, Daniel, okay, can you keep uh, the camera lower? I'm not on there. Oh, whoa. <laughs> 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 okay, are you guys ready for it? I'm going to take a second. Okay, uh, we cheer on oh. three, two, one. Okay. Cheers. Wait, one. Oh, wait. Cheers. I'm gonna, oh, oh, wait one second. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Oh, cheers. Cheers. Yeah. That's it. Cheers. 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 Three, two, one. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's okay. I think, uh, <laughs> nice. I think oh, this yeah. is good, right? <laughs> nice. Yeah. 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 